Then I should be done with all of the grading, probably in the next couple of days. So you should be able to access your midterm grade. I don't know when they'll post them, but I should be done with them by I think Tuesday or Wednesday. So, okay. So if you want, if you're super interested in your midterm grade, it should be coming up soon. Is that tomorrow? Uh, well, so um, no, it won't count your lab grade. Yes, it won't count your lab grade until. So it'll it'll be um, your midterm grade will be kind of and in fact your midterm grade will be deflated relative to your final grade right because you're not counting your lab stuff which is usually for most people boosts them you know and uh, you won't have the curve on the the owl assignments and you won't have the curve on the quizzes you know so. Um, because I can't do that until the end. So, um, but you will have the curves on the two tests. Uh, you might, hopefully we'll get the second exam in there. I'm not sure though, okay? So yeah, I'll tell you next time if it's in there or not. Okay, so um, that's the deal with grades. Um, are there any other questions about that type of stuff? Okay, cool. Um, so let's uh, just finish up chapter six today and then start chapter seven. There was a couple of computer problems this morning, so sorry that the chapter seven slides didn't get up, but they'll be up right after class. So anyways, um, we talked about surface tension and uh, resulting in beating when you, uh, let's see if I have some water, you can see this really clearly, kind of. You can see the little beads there. I mean, this is not the best surface for it, but um, uh, it's the attraction of the surface molecules. Um, actually, kind of the attraction of the molecules underneath the surface molecules that actually are pulling them downward, giving you kind of a beaded shape. Okay, so um, that's why raindrops are uh, spherical in formation because they kind of want to get away from the surrounding atmosphere. Because if you recall, um, water is polar, remember? And air being uh, made up of mostly nitrogen and oxygen, and you guys know how to build those now. But if you look at nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide, And uh, carbon dioxide for that, right? So, are, are any of these molecules polar? Any of these molecules polar? Can anybody tell me that? Is this polar? No. Is this polar? No. Is this polar? No. What about this? to get away from the nonpolar stuff as much as possible, okay? So, um, of course, water is uh, the most common uh, liquid that we'll be de dealing with in this class, so it really uh, will benefit you to start uh, thinking about the properties of it, okay? And then we talked about surfactant, so a substance which decreases the surface tension of water, um, for example, so and this kind of just gets in between the water molecules and disrupts them. Um, so vapor pressure, let's see if we have a good picture of vapor pressure. Well, it doesn't look like it on the slides, but we can draw something. If you can imagine that you've got some sort of glass uh, that's connected to um, a vacuum over here. And there's nothing in the flask or just air in the flask. And if you evacuate that flask, you suck out all the air, then there's nothing left in the flask, right? And then you can imagine adding with a syringe <coughs> right, some liquid. Okay? So the only thing that's in that thing is a liquid. So, I'm going to take the syringe out. What will happen is all the molecules won't stay in the liquid phase. 
what will happen is some of them, to occupy the space up here, will go from the liquid to the vapor phase, like this. And in fact, this happens whether you've evacuated the flask or not. It just happens in a more dramatic fashion when the flask is evac evac evacuated because there's no air occupying that space up there. Okay, so um, what you'll see is out after time, the uh, surface level of the liquid will actually decrease, okay, because some of the molecules went up into the gaseous phase, and there'll be now pressure on the liquid, okay, whereas there wasn't before because we removed all the molecules, okay. So uh, this pressure coming back down on the liquid is known as the vapor pressure, okay. So uh, let's go ahead and describe what we drew there. Place water in a sealed container. Both liquid water and water vapor will exist in the container. Um, how does this happen? It happens be be below the boiling point. Well, the temperature is too low for the boiling conversion. It's just that some of those molecules have enough energy to get over that phase transition. Okay. So um, because the liquid molecules are continuous in continuous motion with their average kinetic energy directly proportioned to the Kelvin temperature. So that's the average is not the uh, energy of the individual particles. Okay, so since the average kinetic energy of those molecules in the liquid phase is lower than what it, they would be at 100 degrees Celsius, which would uh, let them boil, right? The average uh, gives you that the bulk of them will still stay in the liquid phase, okay? But some of them, very few of them, will have enough energy to get out of that liquid phase and go up into uh, the vapor phase, thus causing this vapor pressure, okay? Um, so the average kin molecular kinetic energy increases with temperature, as you would imagine, right? Energy and temperature are essentially the same thing. Okay, so some high energy molecules have sufficient energy to escape the liquid phase. And even at cold temperatures, some molecules can be converted. So if, you, if you've ever sit, you know, set a glass of water out for, I don't know, days at a time, right? Eventually it'll evaporate. All of the water will leave, okay? But it never got above 212 degrees Fahrenheit in your house, right? If if it did, you'd probably be dead, you know? But um, that's the temperature that water boils at, you know? So um, how did that happen? Because you would expect that they would only leave when they get enough energy. Well, what happens is that every individual particle or every individual molecule of water has its own energy spectrum, if you will, right? And if that molecule can get above the energy needed that would be equivalent to getting it to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, then it can go into the vapor phase, okay? Um, so even at cold temperatures, some of these molecules can be converted, and over time, of course, they all will eventually. And you can see, here's a pretty good picture of the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So you see that um, here, when it's cold, uh, most of the molecules, the average number of molecules, the highest peak, which would be where more of the, most of the molecules are, have kind of an average kinetic energy, but you can see the, the whole um, of all of the molecules, so some of them that have a lot of energy are way up here, but there's not very many of them, right? But if we increase that temperature, right, the average kinetic energy increases as well, right? But the distribution of molecules increases too. So you got more molecules that are at the higher range here, right? And so that's why it just boils faster. Okay. Um, so as you can imagine, molecules in the vapor phase can lose energy and convert it back into the liquid phase. Um, so uh, these two processes are known as evaporation. That's the process of conversion of the liquid to a gas at a temperature too low to boil, okay? So we call that evaporation. And condensation is the conversion of the gas back to the liquid. And you can see here, we actually, 
give off energy going from a gas to a liquid. Okay, if you recall the acetone experiment that we did in lab where I poured some acetone in the beaker and I put the two beakers side by side, the one without acetone and the one with acetone, and then you felt it and it was colder, if you recall this, right? It's because of this process here. Well, the opposite of this process, right? So going from a gas to a liquid, that's an exothermic process, so it gives off energy, so you'll feel it get warmer. Okay? But if you recall, when we went from a liquid to a gas, we lost energy, right? So it's the opposite effect. So it's an exothermic process, condensation. Okay? Evaporation is an endothermic process. Okay, and this is essentially what we've described here. Okay, so this is an evacuated um, beaker with a, some sort of petri dish on it, right? And so we just put our liquid in there. So you can see the rate of evaporation is very high. So this, these arrows depict, red depicts that evaporation, blue depicts condensation. At time zero, it's only evaporation and it's very high. Time one, right, some starts coming back down, okay? Time two, a little bit more, and then time infinity or whatever uh, is equal, okay? So you're having equal amounts evaporate and con condense, okay? So that uh, beaker that shows the that there's the equal condensation and evaporation, this beaker is... Uh, known as, well, it's called that it's at uh, equilibrium, okay? So we say that this beaker is at equilibrium because there's just as the rate of evaporating to the rate of condensation is equivalent, okay? So, um, let's see, I can't read that whole thing. Evaporation is endothermic, right? If you recall the acetone speaker. So in the case of the liquid gas equilibria, the point at which vaporization equals condensation is known as the vapor pressure of that liquid. Okay, so when you're at equilibrium, then you can feel how much pressure that uh, liquid on, or the gas on top of the liquid is giving off, and that pressure is known as the vapor pressure, not Anytime here, 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 but we have to wait until we're at equilibrium to figure out what the vapor pressure is. We'll be talking about vapor pressure more later. Okay, I just wanted to introduce it. So boiling point, so remember evaporation and boiling are two different things. Evaporation occurs below the boiling point. Okay? Boiling point is the temperature over which the vapor pressure of the liquid becomes equal to the atmospheric pressure. So the normal boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to 1 atm. Why 1 atm? Because that's the normal atmospheric pressure. So what happens when you go to a mountain where the atm atmospheric pressure is lower than 1 atmosphere? Um, does anybody know? Has anybody gone up to a very high mountain and tried to boil water or go anywhere <laughs> to take the temperature of it? What you find is that it decreases the temperature, okay? And if you were underwater or whatever, it would increase the temperature, you know, that it would take to boil water. In fact, I think if you go to, like, Mount Everest and you tried to boil water at the top of Mount Everest, you could boil water at, like, 78 degrees Celsius as opposed to 100 degrees Celsius. Um, so what is it? <laughs> Boiling point. What? <laughs> yeah, kill <laughs> Boiling point is dependent on the intermolecular forces. So polar molecules have higher boiling points than nonpolar molecules. It's because mol polar molecules are like magnets. They like to stick together. So it's harder to like pull them apart. Okay, nonpolar molecules, they don't like to stick together. So it's not as very hard to pull them apart. Okay, so let's talk about some, uh, some of these, what we call van der Waals forces. Um, in liquids, uh, well, the physical properties of liquids are explained in terms of their intermolecular forces. 
remember what we were talking about. We were just talking about uh, uh, polar molecules stick to each other. Well, let's look at the water actually doing that.
carbon dioxide has a bunch of electrons flowing around through it, uh, a lot, right? Uh, well, however many carbon has, plus as many as each oxygen has, right? And those electrons, you know, are able to flow throughout the molecule. I know we've talked about it concentrating around an atom, right? But there are probability of these electrons to be on this side of the molecule or this side of the molecule. What you'll find is that when two carbon dioxide molecules or two nonpolar molecules kind of come into contact with each other, what they'll do is they'll have their electrons like flowing, 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 right? And then say they're kind of concentrated over here, right? The electron, that's negative charges that I'm showing. And so what happens is this carbon dioxide molecule also has its electrons flowing around here, right? But when it when they come into contact with it, with each other, it feels that this one has a concentration of them here and kind of pushes its own to like the other side. It doesn't like it, okay? So negative and negative don't like each other. Um, this is known when this happens, so now, right, if that's pushed its concentration over here, so now this side of the molecule is more positively charged, right? So now they're kind of very, 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 very slightly um, attracted to each other, even though they're nonpolar, okay? But very, very slightly. That's why carbon dioxide is so hard to get into the solid phase, okay? Like uh, dry ice, you know, melts, uh, or sublimes, I guess, much lower than zero degrees. In fact, if you put your hand on dry ice, you'd probably give yourself a severe burn, right? It's because of this interaction here that it's very hard to keep it in the solid phase, okay? Because this is not a very strong interaction. Remember how I said these are like, these guys are like their, those magnets that you have together, or, well, I guess ionic bonds are more like those magnets that that you can't like pull, you can't even pull them apart, right? But these ones would be more like you got these two magnets, and they're far away from each other, and you let them go and they smack on each other. These ones would be like two refrigerator magnets, right? That you kind of had to like force together or whatever. That's these ones. These also have low boiling points, not, not super low. These have high boiling points relative to their molecular weight. These have mid boiling points relative to molecular weight. And these have very, 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 very low boiling points relative to their molecular weight. In fact, like liquid nitrogen's boiling point is um, negative 78 degrees Celsius. So very cold. Uh, this uh, dry ice is negative 30 degrees Celsius. Right? And remember, water is at zero degrees Celsius. That's the melting point, right? This is a boiling point. So this thing here, this, this making this happen, this is called, this is called a an uh, induced dipole here. Okay, an induced dipole because this is inducing this to occur. Okay. And this one's called an instantaneous. Instantaneous gets near another one, it'll induce the other one to have its own dipole. Okay. So London forces, this is called London forces here. If the electrons are in constant motion, the nonpolar molecule could have an instantaneous dipole. Okay. And uh, induce the dipole here. So London forces exist between all molecules but it's the only attractive force between nonpolar atoms and or molecules. Okay? This is why nonpolar stuff has very, very, very low freezing points, very, very low melting points. 
so there's your instantaneous dipole electrons can be at an instant arranged in such a way that they have a dipole, and the temporary dipole interacts with other temporary dipoles, like here, to cause attraction. Uh, there's hydrogen bonding in a three-dimensional array. You can see it much better. So it's not con really considered a van der Waals force, like I alluded to earlier. It's really a very, very strong dipole-dipole interaction. Okay. So it's a special type of dipole-dipole. Uh, yeah, so you, this really causes the expected boiling point and melting point to be much higher. If you think about the molecular weight of water, right, its boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius, right, and uh, its molecular weight is 18.02 uh, AME. Okay. Uh, this one is negative 30 degrees Celsius, right, and its molecular weight is what? 16 plus 16, that's 32, plus 12, right, that's 44.01. Remember, heavier things, you, we, we thought, well, they're probably, or they're usually going to have higher boiling points than lighter things, right? Because it's just like throwing, we talked about throwing a bowling ball up into the air or throwing a tennis ball up into the air. Which one's easier, right? Throwing the tennis ball up into the air because it doesn't take as much energy, right? But if you think, right, then why is this thing that, you know, over twice as light got, you know, 170 degree temperature difference in the boiling point? You wouldn't expect something like that, right? It's because of these hydrogen bonding. Very important thing that happens. Okay, so, and these are uh, some of the molecules that so hydrogen bonding has an extremely important influence on, on the behavior of many biological systems, like every biological system, since every biological system is composed of about 70% water at least, you know, and water contains these hydrogen bonds, right? Um, these other molecules, ammonia especially, um, is another one that you find in biological systems. HF is not something that you find in biological systems, but it's the only molecule that hydrogen bonds that has a fluorine in it. Okay, so let's talk about the solid phase now. We'll leave the liquid phase behind us. The solid phase is characterized by high density, of course. Right? You, throw, you got a rock, you put it in water, it sinks, right? High density. Uh, in, uh, definite shape, right? we definitely have the shape of these crystals here. Uh, that's independent of the container and small compressibility you can imagine trying to take a hammer and beat a piece of wood or something it won't compress very much and very small thermal expansion you can imagine doing the same thing right trying to put something like wood into the oven without burning it and trying to expand it it won't expand very much relative to like gases or uh, well liquids don't have a very big thermal expansion either. So uh, when we're looking at the particles in solid, of course those were the macromolecular properties. Let's look at the um, properties of the particles uh, in the solid. So they're highly organized and very defined. They, uh, uh, the melting point de depends on the strength of the attractive forces. So Polar solids uh, melt at higher temperature than non-polar solids. <coughs> uh, a crystalline solid is a regular repeating structure. So both the sodium chloride crystal here and the diamond crystal here. So this is just carbon atoms. Uh, those are regular repeating structures. Uh, an amorphous solid is more like sulfur that we saw in the picture before. That is an amorphous solid. It doesn't have a regular repeat. No organized structure. 
Okay, so there's types of crystalline solids that I'd like you to know. <coughs> two of them I've got models of right here on the board, and they're the same two that are right there. So ionic solids, we, we know all this stuff about ionic solids already. They're held together by electrostatic forces, the positive and negative charges of the ion. They're high melting point and boiling point, right? If you recall, uh, they're about 800, 700, 800 to about, you know, 1400 degrees Celsius to melt, right? So very, very high melting. Um, hard and brittle, right? If you've ever got a big chunk of salt and you tried to smash it with a hammer, it would break all over the place. Okay? Um, it would. And uh, if, if they dissolve in water, well, we haven't really, we, we'll talk, we talked a little bit about electrolytes, about how we can carry the charge on the ions. We'll talk more about this electrolyte in the next chapter, okay? But if it dissolves in water, we call it an electrolyte. Okay? NaCl is an example of that. So there's NaCl, there's another picture of NaCl, and there's a, so this is the chemical structure of it, that's the macromolecular structure of it. Okay? So if I talk about particles, I want you to tell me about particles, I want you to tell me about this. Right? I don't want you to tell me the volume is uh, regular, or the volume tetrahedral structure around each of the atoms, okay? And it's because carbon, you know, would prefer to have a tetrahedral structure, if you remember CH4, right, that's a tetrahedron. Okay? So these are held together by entirely covalent bonds. So it's a big, you know, conglomerate of covalent bonds. So it's like one big molecule. So it's one big molecule. It's very big. Uh, high belt High melting point and boiling point, uh, as you can imagine, it's probably not very easy to melt or get a diamond into a gaseous phase, right? And very, very hard. Carbon. Carbon. C. C. Infinity. Whatever. However many carbon atoms are in that particular sample. So there's a few different what we call allotropes of carbon. Diamond is one of them. Uh, if you've heard of Buckminster fullerenes or buckyballs, that's another one. So it kind of looks like these geodesic domes. Have you ever, um, have you ever seen these kind of domes, like the biodome? Anybody ever seen that Poly Shore biodome or whatever that thing that they? That's what. Uh, that's like half of uh, buckyball. Or graphite, you use graphite in your, yeah, that's carbon too. So those are the three allotropes of carbon. So diamond looks like this, where it's all tetrahedral, right? Graphite looks like this. I'm not going to draw a buckyball because, I don't know. Or have you ever, you ever heard of that place, the Louvre? The Louvre? Anybody know that place? Yeah. Uh, outside of the Louvre, right, there's these kind of structures that look kind of like buckyballs. Or, so we go look at pictures of that. But um, uh, the structure of graphite Flat sheets 
lot. Car carbon is so um, prevalent in uh, different structures, especially like organic and biological systems, you know, that you start uh, condensing the structures and not representing the carbon atoms at all or the hydrogen atoms. So this is all like shorthand. But you can see these, this is actually a plane. All of these atoms are in the same plane. But if you compare that to the diamond up there, they're not all in the same plane. Is that why it's like a special feature of the No. Uh-huh. It's uh, trigonal plane, if you want to think about it. Yeah. So you can see, right? So if we cut, cut it up, we'll just cut it up. So look, and all of them are the same. All the carbons are the same. And so if you think of this as being the central carbon there, right? These are all in the same plane. The bond angle there must be 120 degrees, okay? And there's one, two, three of them, right? So it's trigonal plane. Okay, so molecular solids, these are just solids that are cooled down below their uh, uh, freezing point, like ice, or in this case, uh, frozen methane. So they're just kind of, instead of that whole conglomerate structure, there are a bunch of little things stuck to each other. Okay? And then, of course, there's metallic solids, like this. Um, lightning rod here have been struck. Um, so these are metal atoms held together what, what, with what we call metal bonds, which is just metal atoms kind of squished together. So if you've ever seen like a copper pipe or something like that, there's no real bond between those copper atoms. They're just pushed together, okay? Pushed together in what we call a sea of electrons, okay? So they all share their electrons with each other. That's why when, you know, you take a copper pipe and touch an electric fence, right? You feel it like flow through you or whatever. Okay. Huh? <laughs> okay, so um, you have this overlap of orbitals of the metal atoms. So they kind of just kind of stick together and they share their electrons together. Um, the overlap causes regions of high electron density where the electrons are extremely mobile and they'll conduct electricity. So that's that. That bad.